one. We'll just okay. the, the first thing I'll talk about today is kind of a parent bill of rights. And that is what kind of rights do you have as a parent or as an advocate working with parents in uh, working with a school district or working on the IEP team? Um, now I will talk about these rights and I'm also gonna talk a little about where these rights end because there are some areas that really parents have a right to certainly be discussing but they, they don't have as clear rights as they do uh, to actually do anything beyond discuss and we'll get into that. Uh, then I wanna talk a little about the six big ideas of six big ideas in IDEA and of course IDEA is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Uh, that is our special education law. And it has, a no, it's, a, it's a very complex law. It's a long law. And if you have any uh, problems with sleeping, if you get that law and take it to bed with you one night, it will put you right to sleep. It's um, mostly, it's a very technical law, but there's part of the law that specifically addresses the rights that parents have and, and, their, and their youngsters or, or their, their children have to receive what is called a free appropriate public education. So I'm gonna talk about six big ideas around parental rights and, uh, and student rights. I'm not gonna talk about them all. I'm gonna basically focus on two. One is what is called Free Appropriate Public Education or FAPE. Um, and the other is Least Restrictive Environment or often called just LRE. And those are two very almost kind of central things in the law that we as parents, as advocates for parents really need to understand. Uh, as we work with school districts. The last thing I will get to, and I don't know how much time we'll have for this, is I'm gonna go over real briefly procedural safeguards and, and especially what are called do, uh, dispute resolution. Um, that is what rights do you have when the school district and personnel in the school district and parents cannot agree on an issue? What do you do then? Uh, so that is essentially what I wanna go over today. When I talk about FAPE, a major part of FAPE is of course, the Individual Education Program or the IEP. So I will be talking about that uh, in a fair amount of detail too. And there are other very important issues uh, that you as parents, as parent advocates will no doubt uh, be accustomed to or, or be a, a in, a integrated uh, into. And that is, there are other areas that we won't, will not address today, like Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Those are very important laws um, that have a great deal of effect on not only youth with disabilities, but all persons with disabilities. Um, but today we're gonna be pretty much uh, concentrating on the parent of the school-aged child and what I mean by when I say school age child between the ages of three and 21. And I'll explain that in a little while. But what I'd like to do first is, is talk about a parent bill of rights. And these are areas in which um, we as parents, as advocates, and I know many of you, I have been a teacher uh, and a professor. I'm also a parent of three now adult children. Uh, but two who had special ed. So I've uh, sat on both sides of the IEP table and uh, there are things very important that we need to understand about the rights that you have as a parent or that your parents will have if you're, if you're acting in an advocacy role. And we'll go through these real quickly, but number one is you have a right to receive a notice of what procedural safeguards you have. I'll talk about this more in, in a few minutes, but there are a number of procedural safeguards that the idea contains. And essentially the purpose of these procedural safeguards is to ensure that parents are equal partners with school district personnel 
in the development of their child's special education program. And um, one of the very first things that parents get when they are um, beginning in the special ed process through either child fine or if a ch their child is referred is a notice of procedural safeguards. And these are, these are the rights that we'll be talking about. So the school districts in which you work are also responsible for providing these safeguards to you. Um, one of the first major safeguards, and I think Family Connection does a, a really good job on this, is uh, parents have the right to know and understand their rights in their native language or mode of communication that they understand best. Um, and so if at any time parents have difficulty, uh, is English as a second language or they do not speak much English, uh, the school district has to make certain that they know their rights in their native language. Another uh, parental right, the third parental right that I wanna talk about a little, a little bit is you have the right, you as a parent or parents have the right to receive notice which is called prior written notice or oftentimes just referred to by the acronym PWN at any time before the school changes a child's identification, evaluation, program or placement or refuses to make a change. Uh, so what that means is if a parent requests that something be done, the school district has to discuss it. And if they choose to do it, to make a change, uh, they have to do a, this notice called a prior written notice. Or if they refuse to do it, they have to do a prior written notice. And the purpose of this is written notice is given prior to, to taking any action concerning, say, a child's placement or program. And it gives the parents a, a chance to say no, in essence or a chance to disagree. So that's a very important procedural safeguard. Also, um, they have the right to understand every, every document that they sign. So if they're asked to sign documents and they're unclear, clearly you ask a question. You have the school district personnel tell you about the documentation, what it means, uh, because every signature that a school district gets in special ed, such as when a, a parent signs to have their child uh, assessed or when they sign uh, a form to have their child admitted into special education, they have to give what is called informed written consent, which means they have to understand what they're signing before they sign it. And uh, so that will usually be explained um, school districts will not take actions in most cases without uh, requesting that a, that a parent sign this document. Now, the other rights they have. There is a law uh, called the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act that was passed in 1974. It's a federal law that says essentially parents have the right to access and obtain copies of their child's educational record. Now there are limits to that. You can't ask for, say, if a school psychologist or a counselor takes notes during a meeting, those are not available. They are not part of the educational record, but any part of the educational record, such as the assessment data, the IEP, that is available to the parents. They have a right to see it. They have a right to obtain uh, copies of it. Um, under this law, FERPA, which was folded into the IDEA, so these rights are also IDEA rights. Also, parents have the right under this law, FERPA, to maintain confidentiality. School district personnel must not um, provide educational records to persons that do not have a legitimate reason to access those records. So oftentimes, um, a school district will 
have a, a psychological record and that will be shared with counselors and a child's teachers and of course the child's parents, but that cannot be shared with people who do not have a reason to access that information. So remember as parents, not only do you have the right to access and obtain records, they do have the right to confidentiality of records. I've talked about this before, but they also have the right to request an evaluation of a child. So if a, in most cases, school districts have what is called an, uh, an affirmative obligation to find children with potential disabilities who need special ed in their school districts. And they use a, a process called child find in which they actively look to try and find children with disabilities who may need to be evaluated for services. Um, they usually do this they, with young children. They may do it through kindergarten roundups, things like that. With children in schools, they often have referral systems where uh, school district personnel can refer a child for uh, a possible special education evaluation. But a parent has also the right to refer their child. Uh, to a school district. So if a parent uh, calls you uh, and is concerned that their child may have a disability, it is perfect, it's within their rights to call the school district and ask for an initial evaluation. As I said, in most cases, this will actually be done by a school district because they tend to be uh, very good at, um, at looking because they have this, as I said, affirmative duty. Now, before they, however, before they can do an evaluation, they do have to get parental consent. Also, every three years when a child is in special ed, a school district must do a reevaluation of the child. Um, every year they do a evaluation, but they must essentially do a reevaluation every three years to determine if a child still has a disability as an, and is in need of special education services. And um, that reevaluation, parents also have to consent to that. Although it sometimes it'll involve uh, testing, sometimes it won't, but it, it's up to the school district with the parent to make that decision. Now, another very important right uh, that parents have is the right to request what is called an independent educational evaluation, often called just an IEE, if they disagree with the school district's evaluation. So let's say this, you're working with a, a child or your own child, a school district has done evaluation and you do not feel it was done uh, completely, did not address all the child's needs, you could go to the school district and request an independent educational evaluation. What that generally means is you talk to the school district if um, what they have to do then is give the parent a list of evaluators uh, that this parent could contact and these evaluators would be independent of the school district um, to conduct an evaluation of the child. A school district's uh, usually will consent to these. Uh, if they don't, they can go to a due process hearing and, um, and make their case that a, a further evaluation is not needed. Or in many cases, if a parent is concerned uh, that an, an issue hasn't been addressed in the evaluation, just by uh, talking to the school district team, uh, that will often be done. So, but that is a right, the right to independent educational evaluation. Parents also have the right to be a collaborative member of the team that determines their child's eligibility for special education. So every, every school district, public school district will have what's called a, they are called different names, multidisciplinary teams, child study teams, teacher assistant teams, there are a number of different names. And essentially what this team does is they're the ones who are actively or affirmatively trying to find children with special education needs who have disabilities under the idea. 
Uh, and if a parent's child is referred to this team, they have the right to collaborate with this team in determining um, their child's uh, need for special education services. Uh, they also have the right, if, if a child is determined to be eligible for special education, which means they would have a disability in one of 13 disability category areas, and as a result of that disability, do need special education related services. Of course, a, an IEP team or an individualized education program planning team is convened to write or develop the child's educational program. And uh, this team must include the child's parents or parent or a guardian, um, someone to act instead of the parent if the parent in the place of the parent, if the parent can't be reached. But usually this team will consist of all of a, of a parent or parents. And it also must consist of a representative of, of, the, of the school district, usually a principal or associate principal, um, uh, a, a general education teacher who works with a child, a special education teacher must be on this team and other members can also be on this team and including someone who can uh, address the instructional implications of the evaluation results. But the important thing to understand here is parents have the right to be a participating member of this team. Now, one of the things this team will do, we'll talk a little more about this later, is they will develop a program for the child. And very importantly, they must develop a way to monitor their child's the child's progress or the student's progress toward the goals that they write. Parents have the, have the right to receive data, usually every at least every four to six weeks, on how their child is making progress. Um, Parent, a school district personnel have to uh, involve the parent in monitoring and reporting on student progress. Uh, they also have parents also have the right to request an IEP meeting and participate in all meetings regarding their child. And they also have the right finally to pursue these dispute resolution options if they uh, disagree with the school. Now, these Bill of Rights or these parental rights do end at a certain point. Parents do not have the right to do certain things. And I'll talk more about these in a, in a minute, but essentially we know from court decisions throughout the country is it's pretty much the school district's personnel's decision regarding the use of a particular methodology. Um, for example, um, Maybe um, a parent wants a particular type of reading program, say um, Orton-Gillingham, which is a common. And the school uses a type of Orton-Gillingham uh, called Project Read. Well, the parents, uh, I'm probably, probably not the greatest uh, illustration because when there's, there's sometimes will be a difference. Uh, where parents want a particular methodology, and uh, school districts do not do not believe that is the appropriate methodology to use, the courts pretty much side with the school district on issues such as this because they believe, you know, that school district personnel are the experts regarding methodology. So those are pretty much uh, decisions that are left to the school district. Uh, similarly, a school can't be required to place a child by a parent in a particular setting. So example, if a parent would want the ch child at a certain school, that is not the right of the parent to do that. That is a school district personnel decision. Ne neither do parents have the right to require a particular type of service or technology uh, be used. That is a school district decision. And parents, although this doesn't happen as much as it, as it once did, and when I was teaching, I remember this, uh, parents would reject an IEP. And they'd say, we don't want an IEP, we want a 504 plan. Uh, 
not a good idea because 504 plans do not have nearly the, the rights of parents and the students, children do not have the rights under 504 as they do under the idea. And also courts have been saying, if you essentially, some courts have said, if you reject an IEP, you also reject a 504 plan. So these are not, these are kind of where the parents' rights end. And it's important that we understand that. Um, however, parents have the right to raise any of the issues I just talked about and have the issue discussed at the IEP meeting. After discussing the issue, however, school personnel on the IEP team could decide against the parent's position. Now, parents would have the right to dispute that, but nonetheless, uh, courts have always pretty much decided in those areas that that is, the that is the right of school district personnel to make those decisions. So those are uh, some parental rights that I want to talk about. There's some really good websites um, that have great information for parents. I would uh, refer you to, of course, one of them is the Family Connection website. It's wonderful information on it. Uh, there is a couple here I put down. There's one called the Center for Parent Information and Resources, which is the first one I've listed, which is a, a very good site. It's essentially meant for parent centers like Family Connection, but there's also some really good information for parents on that. Uh, there's a really excellent website called Understood. It is, uh, you can find it at understood.org. And this is a collaboration of the National Council for Children with Learning Disabilities and 18 other advocacy organizations have banded together to create the Understood website. Excellent information on that. I'd refer you all to that. Uh, there's an uh, Exxon, I'm not sure if they're actually doing it anymore. I think they are, but there's uh, Why Service videos on YouTube uh, that you can go to. And if you just put YouTube, your special education rights, there's a number of really good um, YouTube presentations, generally very short in nature. Like they'll have one on independent educational evaluations that, and usually they'll be, have two people discussing it, one being an attorney, one being a parent advocate, and they'll discuss parent rights. So I'll look that up on YouTube. There's some really good information there. Um, the South Carolina Office of Special Ed Services, or OSES, has excellent information. Um, and so if you uh, go to that site and, uh, and just look around, you'll find quite a bit. And finally, uh, there is an attorney who uh, was a advocate, uh, one of the uh, primary, I would say the premier parent advocate attorney in special aid in the country named Peter Wright, who has a website, he and his wife, it's called Wright's Law. Uh, they have maintain a blog, have a lot of good information on that. Uh, I would also, and I didn't put it down here, uh, direct you just to the U.S. Department of Education website, which is just simply ed.gov. Uh, lots of good information for parents on that website. So, um, Suzanne, uh, because I'm uh, sharing my screen, I'm unable to uh, get any of the uh, chat. So if there's any questions, if you would like to just uh, break in and ask, an, ask them, that would be great too. And again, if any of you want to uh, have a question, um, please uh, let me know. And I'm gonna stop share for a second. I'm not really certain if I'm going to be able to um, see much in terms of chat or, or uh, questions, so I might, just have to ask Suzanne if you will um, please share any information. Sure, um, I can read it out for you right now. Okay, great. So we do have one in here and says, does this include all progress monitoring data? Okay, that's a very good question. And you're talking about, I assume, 
uh, the reports that uh, school district personnel, when they write annual goals in the student's IEP, are required to also write how they're going to measure progress toward those goals. And I know uh, we used to have a lunch and learn uh, through the Family Connection, and one, one of ours was totally devoted to uh, writing goals and to understanding goals. But teachers have to write goals that are measurable, and then they actually have to measure them. And they have to report to a student's parent, usually as often as general ed students get a report card on how well, uh, how their child is making progress toward the goals. Um, this is actually a problem uh, because oftentimes goals are not measurable and the law requires the data be collected on these measurable goals and reported to parents. And if schools do not, school personnel do not legitimately collect data, um, it's, it's very difficult, but they have to. So um, a recent decision by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has said that parents must understand they're not only in the IEP for eligibility and determining program, they're also there to make certain the program is implemented and uh, in, implemented correctly, which includes monitoring the student's progress. So it's, it, well, yes, it is up to school personnel to monitor progress. This data is supposed to be shared with parents. And if it's not, um, that's, a, that's a problem. Um, I've served as expert witnesses on a number of cases and um, for both parents and school districts. And what I can tell you is that this is an area that school districts often have problems. Uh, actually writing goals that are truly measurable and then collecting data to ensure those goals are being measured and the child is making progress toward those goals. So yes, uh, that data has to be shared with the student's parents on every goal that is written in the IEP. Literally has to be measured, data has to be shared. As I said, as an expert witness um, in many cases, this is where school districts have problems, are in writing the goals in a measurable format, actually collecting legitimate data on the goals and then making decisions. So does that answer your question? Uh, I think I'm looking now, that was Angela, I believe. I also saw a question who pays for an IE, that would be at public expense. So unless the school district goes to a hearing and does, and the hearing officer believes a, uh, an IEE or independent educational evaluation is not required, that is paid for by the school district once per year, so. Okay, I think that's all the questions. I do see another one I've been told in a recent IEP meeting that students on the diploma track cannot get modifications on their IEP. Specifically, I've been asking for shortened assignments or simplified assessments, assignments that address the state standards, but are modified to the instructional level of student. Um, ask them, uh, school district personnel to show me a written policy that states what they told me, I'm still waiting. They're really, no, that, that would not be accurate. That, um, an IEP often inc must include special ed services, but also accommodations and modifications if necessary. Um, and even if they're on the diploma track, that really wouldn't make a difference. So um, I'm gonna go back now and start talking about some big ideas of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And um, there's, as I said, the, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or the IDEA is a very complex law. It's a very long law, difficult to understand, but at its heart, and this is, it's actually, you'll sometimes heard uh, part, people say, oh, part B of the IDEA. The IDEA is divided into four parts, parts A, B, C, and D. If you have a young child, 
or an infant's and toddler or infant or toddler with disability, part C is the part that addresses you. Part B is the, in, is the section of the law that addresses school age children. And this is what I'm gonna be talking about. And essentially there are six big ideas. And we're not gonna talk about all of these. We're gonna go over a couple of them. Um, and these are not actually, if you looked in the log, you would not find these sections. There is, if you read part B, there are six major parts to the law. Uh, number one is zero reject, essentially means that if child has a disability, no matter how severely disabling, and they need special ed, the school district cannot reject them from services. Second is protection and evaluation that uh, has a number of uh, procedures that school districts must follow in assessing and evaluating children for special education. Number three is free appropriate public education, often just called FAPE, um, which is really kind of the heart of the law. It says that every child with a disability under the, who is accepted or eligible under the idea must receive a free appropriate public education that is free, it doesn't cost them anything. It's appropriate for their needs. It addresses their individual needs and it's public, uh, private, uh, not a private school, it's public preschool, elementary and secondary school. And the way a FAPE is defined for each child is through their individualized education program or IEP. Fourth big idea is least restrictive environment. Uh, which we'll get into that in a sec, in a minute, but essentially means it's often just called LRE, that children with disabilities must be educated with children who are not disabled to the maximum extent appropriate. There are procedural safeguards, which we'll talk about, which are really uh, procedures to ensure parents are uh, equal partners in special education. Uh, or IEP development. And then parental participation is kind of the ultimate procedural safeguard and it underlies virtually everything in special education. But I'm gonna uh, really talk about two of these or uh, possibly three, but more likely just two of them today. And the first one I wanna talk about is free appropriate public education or FAPE. What exactly does that mean? Well. What it means is that all children must receive, all children with disabilities who are determined to be eligible under the idea. And again, they are in one of 13 disability categories. And because of that disability, they require a special education. The law, according to the law, the law mandates that they receive this free appropriate public education. Um, and it's, since 1975, when, our, when the law, the idea, was not even called the idea, when it was first passed in 1975, it was called the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, or we often called it, uh, and when I was a teacher, we called it PL 94142, which just simply meant the 142nd public law passed in the 94th Congress, but it was kind of a, a nice shorthand, so we talked about um, PL 94-142, 1990, the name of this law was changed to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So it's usually just referred to as the idea now. Now, this is the essence of special education. We must, as educators, provide a special education that confers this free appropriate public education upon students with disabilities. This has been part of the law since 1975. And um, Congress, when they passed this law, decided not to really define it. I mean, they listed a, a few aspects of what constituted faith, but instead of defining it, they really chose a way to define it through school district personnel and working and parents working together to establish this document we call the Individualized Education Program. 
fact, one of the original uh, congressional, actually was a senator, uh, co-authors of the idea, then PL 94-142, was a man named Robert Stafford from, he was a senator from Vermont. In 1978, he, he wrote a, a little article for the Vermont Law Review in which he said, we did not attempt to define appropriate, but instead we established a baseline mechanism, a written document called the Individualized Education Program or IEP. That was the document that would become the blueprint of every individual child's fate. So um, let me go back here for a second. So in terms of the actual definition, it, it, there really isn't a definition. It says it, you know, it's at no cost to the parents and it involves uh, preschool education, secondary education, elementary education, and it must uh, conform to whatever the state educational agency uh, has write, written or requires about a FAPE. States cannot offer less, but they can offer more than the federal doc, federal uh, law does. And in, in most states, such as South Carolina, we do not have a lot beyond what the federal law requires. So there's only one area we really do, and that's in transition programming. Uh, the idea of the federal law requires that transition programming begin at age 16, but in South Carolina, it's 13. So we have to follow that our state law has something, uh, has actually a part of FAPE in excess or in addition to the federal law. And if we have part of our law, which is offering more to youngsters with disabilities than does the federal law, we have to follow that. So that's very important to understand. But in terms of FAPE, the really important things to understand is there's like three important dimensions. Uh, first is what is called the procedural dimension. That is school district personnel have to follow certain um, requirements of federal and state law when they accomplish certain specific idea related tasks. So this is what the law says you have to do, how you do it and when you do it. So like there's a timeline for between Deck, when a, both between when a child is declared eligible and when services must be provided. That's a procedure and it must be followed. There are a lot of procedures about IEPs. Those sorts of procedures have to be followed. So there's a procedural dimension of FAPE. There's also a substantive dimension of FAPE, which means which that really has to do with kind of content of the IEP or the what of the IEP. And it really fo focuses on is the IEP adequate uh, to uh, uh, enable a child to make progress? Uh, and we'll talk more about these in a, in a minute. That's the substantive dimension. And thirdly, there's, a, there's an implementation dimension of the law that focuses on carrying out the IEP as parents and school district personnel agree upon. So understand that there's three different responsibilities that school districts have. There's the procedural responsibilities, which I refer to as the procedural dimension of FAPE, the substantive dimension of FAPE or substantive responsibilities, and then their implementation responsibilities. And what I'd like to do now is talk about in, in a little more detail these three types of dimensions. Um, let me go back here. First, we have the procedural requirements. These are procedures that school district personnel must adhere to in terms of timelines, in terms of developing IEPs. They're really put in the law to ensure that the rights of parents and their child with a, who has a disability uh, to, is to receive a FAPE by requiring the school district to take certain actions 
to involve parents in the special education process. Uh, and this is actually uh, this whole notion of procedures and substance in the law was actually developed by the Supreme U.S. Supreme Court way back in 1982 in a case called Board of Education v. Rowley. And Board of Education v. Rowley uh, said there are two major uh, requirements of school districts. The first are the procedural requirements. And in order to determine if a school has complied with the procedures, that is an important part of determining a child's fate. So um, this Supreme Court case, Board of Education v. Rowley, involved a young deaf girl, but it started as every case does at the IEP table. And there was a disagreement with the parents and the school district personnel that they could not uh, reach agreement on, went, went to due process, then went to the courts, uh, and eventually ended up in the Supreme Court. And they said there's two major requirements that school districts have, and courts have to use these and due process hearing officers to determine if a student has received a FAPE or free appropriate public education. And the number one test in, these, in this two-part test, the Supreme Court said is, has the school district complied with the procedures set forth in the law? So there's a number of different procedures that school districts have to follow. And they're very well aware of what these procedural requirements are. Um, and I would say the ultimate of all these procedural safeguards is making certain that the parent is a meaningful participant in the collaborative IEP process. So, all these procedures are, are set up to ensure that parents and their students are in the, are, the process goes smoothly and they're involved in special ed. Uh, an example would be the IEP process. Um, school districts have to uh, field an IEP team that is composed of a certain number of individuals, including the representative of a representative of the local school district, maybe a principal or associate principal, um, has to be a special ed teacher. There has to be a general ed teacher on there. There has to be someone who can explain the instructional implications of evaluation results. These development procedures have to be followed. If they're not followed, that could be an error that in itself would uh, mean a school district or a, a court, I should say, or a hearing officer would determine that a FAPE was not delivered. So these procedures are very important and school district personnel will understand what these procedures are. Other IEP procedures are, there are certain um, requirements in every IEP. For example, there has to be annual, measurable annual goals. There have to be need statements called present levels of academic achievement and functional performance that uh, say what the child's needs are. If they're not there, that is a procedural error. Um, so those are very serious uh, issues that schools always uh, must be addressing. Now, the second type of requirements according to the Supreme Court that school districts have are what are called substantive requirements. And the substantive requirements of FAPE really refer to the school district's obligation to provide an IEP that is designed to lead to student progress. Now, there have been about 13, depending on your count, cases uh, involving special education that have been heard by the US Supreme Court. Of course, the US Supreme Court is the highest court in the land. And when they make a decision, that decision is binding throughout the, uh, throughout the United States and, and, and the territories of the United States. And in 2017, in a very famous case called Andrew F. v. Douglas County School District, the um, Supreme Court addressed the substantive issues uh, or substantive requirements of the idea in terms of what does it mean for a child to receive educational benefit? 
And what the Supreme Court said is every student's IEP must be reasonably calculated to enable the child to make progress appropriate in light of his or her circumstances. So what they did is said, well, in the Rowley case, we said the first part of the test is a child receiving FAPE really has to do with is the child or did the, did the school district meet these procedural requirements of law? Now, the second part of the test or the substantive part of the test is really from the Andrew F. decision. That is, did the I, was the IEP that was written for a student reasonably calculated to enable that child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances? And what essentially that means is that's really a content issue, saying that the content of the IEP has to be such that it will likely result or may actually result in, the, in a child making progress. And so earlier, the question about collecting data on child's pro progress is that important. That's extremely important for this specific question because you can't really determine progress unless you have a way to collect data. And that data has to be shared with the student's parents. So anyway, there are four IEP content questions that are really at the heart of the substantive requirements of the idea. And the first are, what are the student's unique academic and functional needs that must be addressed in the IEP? So once an IEP is written, the starting point of the, uh, that IEP is to look at the child, look at the assessments, but done interview parents and teachers and determine what are the unique needs that we have to address in a child's special education program in writing the IEP. And these questions or these needs are presented at the beginning of the IEP in what's called the present levels of academic and academic achievement and functional performance. So all IEPs start out by identifying a child's needs. And this is where it's very important that school district personnel and parents work together to make certain all of a child's needs are addressed, academic and functional. And functional means those needs that a child may have that have nothing to do with academics, but will allow them to live an independent life. Uh, communication, uh, behavioral, socialization, social emotional, those are functional needs. So if a child has functional needs that, that must be addressed for them to receive a FAPE, they have to be included in the need statement. And if a child has academic needs that must be addressed, or they have both, they have to be addressed in the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. And if they're not, it's very likely that the IEP will be incorrect because all of a child's needs, regardless of the disability, must be addressed. Now, the second big content question is all based on these needs, what measurable annual goals should be included in the student's IEP to address the academic and functional needs. So if a child has a reading need, you have to have a reading goal. Furthermore, the goal has to be ambitious and it has ambitious enough to allow the student to make progress. Um, also, it has to be measurable. And this is where uh, I think school districts often have problems is writing goals that are actually measurable. And I've always thought an important question that parents and school district personnel must ask when looking at annual goals is, could we graph the goal? Could we put where the child is in terms of, re of reading ability and where we want them to be at the end of the year? Because that's what an annual goal is. It's a projection of if we give the child appropriate services, what will we be, what progress will we expect in one year's time? We have to have a way to measure that. Um, 
So it's very important that goals be measurable. And as, as I've said, oftentimes, this is a problem that school districts have, uh, school personnel sometimes have, is how exactly do you ensure that goals are measurable and what kind of information can we collect to ensure that the goals are actually, will actually be measured? And then what will we do with this data? So measurable, I would say ambitious annual goals, very important part of the IEP content questions. Third major content issue is how are we gonna measure progress toward these measurable goals? So if, if the IEP includes goals that are measurable, how are you gonna measure them? What processes are you gonna to adopt to measure these goals? Well, there are many very user-friendly ways available to school district personnel to write measurable goals and then actually measure them. And one typical way that's used in many school districts is what is called formative evaluation or, or curriculum-based measurement is a type of that. Uh, very simple user-friendly ways to measure student progress toward an annual goal. But it's very important that the IEP identify how is the goal student's progress going to be measured. And fourth, what academic or functional services will be provided to students so they may reach their annual goals. So what are we gonna do? As school district personnel, parents working together, what kind of services do we need, do we believe a child will need to meet their annual goals? If it's reading, do they need a special class in reading one hour a day, uh, five days a week? If it's a communication goal or a functional goal, do they need speech and language therapy? You know, 10 minutes or half an hour a week. Uh, those are services or special ed services that we would put down. Now, maybe, and um, maybe we've determined that a child, because they have a learning disability uh, and are unable to read, maybe we as a team, parents and school district personnel working together, make decide that all of a child's tests in his or her academic subjects will be read by uh, an aide or a peer to the child. So the tests will be read to the child. That would be an example of a supplementary service that we might put down. So these four content questions are at the heart of what uh, the content or the substantive issue in FAPE. So first the needs, the next is the goals that are written to address these needs. Third is the progress state, the methods of monitoring student progress. And then finally, the services that we're going to provide to ensure that the student can meet those goals. So that's again, the heart of the substantive. So if we look at it in a graphic type format, the IEP must include present levels of academic achievement and functional performance statements. And in fact, those statements have to address every need that the child has related to the child's disability regardless of what we call what their disability category is. So if for instance their emotion they're determined to be have emotional behavioral disability, but they also have uh, academic problems, that has to be there. All of a child's needs must be addressed. Now most of the time with academic needs and functional performance, we're going to write measurable goals, annual goals, and we have to determine how we're gonna measure those goals. Um, if a need, there some, will be instances where a need might not require a goal. In that case, you go directly to the special ed and related services because every need listed in the IEP must have a special education or related service or supplementary aid service or accommodation that addresses those needs. Um, for example, let's say the child had, had a visual impairment 
and uh, the team decided they would get large print books in all their classes. Well, you wouldn't need to have a goal about a large print book, but that would be a service. That would be a supplementary service that you'd provide or accommodation. Um, so sometimes needs won't require goals, but usually they're gonna, academic or functional needs will require goals and special education services. It's very important to understand that these things must fit together in an IEP. An IEP must be internally consistent. That means if there's a need addressed, you absolutely have to have services to address those needs. And that could be special ed services. It could be related services that are services that a child would need to uh, be able to uh, benefit from their special education. It could be accommodations and modifications, could be supplementary um, aids and services, but there are all needs must have a special ed service. And most needs are going to have a, a measurable annual goal and a measure, method to measure that, those goals. Now, that's what I refer to when I call internal consistency. The IEP hangs together. All the parts relate to each other. And let me give you a brief example over a, a case I just served as an expert witness in. Um, what happened is a school district had an IEP. Uh, the IEP uh, listed mathematics as a, as a need, an academic need. Um, but in the rest of the IEP, mathematics was never addressed. There were no goals in mathematics. There are obviously no way to measure goals. And there's no special ed or related services or any services having to do with mathematics. So what happened is the school district had an internally inconsistent IEP. There was a need on one hand, but it wasn't addressed. That is a fatal error for school districts because you, when that happens, you're not meeting the, the district would not be meeting the substantive requirements of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So think in terms of a big picture like this, the assessment of a child underlies everything. Um, the assessment is done for eligibility purposes, but it's also done for planning a child's instruction. That's why it's the, the assessment is so important um, because it, it's the foundation of the IEP triangle or the house. If you don't have the assessment done properly, the rest of the IEP is probably incorrect too. So as a parent, as a school district, as school district personnel, as a parent advocate, you want to make certain that all of the child's needs are addressed during the assessment. And that is where we talked about the IEE or independent educational evaluation fits in if a child's, um, if the assessment is not complete. Now, based on the assessment, the collaborative team, the school personnel, parents working together develop the educational program. That's the goals, the objectives, the services. And then the final part of the big picture would be progress monitoring. The school district has to have a way to collect data on a child's progress toward each goal that they write, and they have to report this data to a student's parents. So uh, last thing I wanted to say about this is uh, two of my favorite authors, one of my favorite authors, Barbara Bateman, um, wrote a book with Barbara uh, Marianne Linden, 2012, where she made this statement, the IEP is like a house. The assessment is the foundation upon which the house is built. Neither a house nor a student's IEP can stand on a faulty foundation. If a student's assessment, the foundation of the IEP is faulty, the IEP will not stand. So very important. The IEP, the, we remember the importance of internal consistency and also the importance of the assessment or present levels of academic achievement and functional performance as driving the IEP. 
Now, the last thing I want to talk about in terms of this are implementation requirements. So we have, remember I was talking about the three dimensions of faith. We have procedural, we have substantive, which we just talked about, and we have implementation. These implementation requires re requirements of the of the idea refer to the obligation of a school district of school district personnel to execute the IEP as collaboratively developed. So when the parents and school personnel work together and develop an IEP, implementation of that IEP is very important. Um, and as I mentioned before, there was this case which I cite here called a quote from MCV Antelope Valley Union High School District 2017. Uh, it was case heard by the court right under the Supreme Court. And they said, they made the following statement. The IEP like a contract embodies a binding commitment and provides notice to both parties as to what services will be provided to the student. So that deserves a little explanation. The IEP is like a contract in that it's a binding commitment between the parents and the school personnel to provide the services that we said we'd provide in the IEP. And that way it's very much like a contract. You have to implement it as written. In fact, school districts have lost cases even when they've done a great procedural job and the substantive uh, elements of the IEP have been excellent, but they just have not, or they have failed to implement. They would lose, even despite having an excellent IEP, if they don't implement properly. And according to the MC School District, parents are part of this implementation because they also have the rights not just to develop the IEP, but to enforce its implementation. Now, IEP is not like a contract and it's not a guarantee of success. So there are goals that are written if those goals are not met and the school has done their job in monitoring the student's progress and if progress wasn't being made that they've made instructional changes. If they still don't make the goals, that's not what I mean by the IEP is like a contract because the IEP is not a guarantee of success. The IEP is a guarantee that we as school district personnel will provide the services that we said we, we would provide. Now, I wanna go through this one real quickly because it's part of least restrictive, and it's part of FAPE, um, and it's, it's a major principle of the idea. It is uh, a two-part requirement of the idea, saying to the maximum extent appropriate, children with disabilities are to be educated with children who are not disabled, but removal can occur when education in regular classes with the use of supplementary aids and services cannot be achieved satisfactorily. So this is what attorneys may call a rebuttable presumption. There's a presumption that all students are to be educated together uh, to the maximum extent appropriate. Children with disabilities must be educated with children who are not disabled. If that, however, is not appropriate, Children may be removed, but that may only occur when education in the regular classroom has been, with the use of supplementary aids and services, cannot be achieved satisfactorily. And to this end, every school um, in the country, actually, every public school has to have what's called a continuum of alternative placements, which is a regular, starts with the regular classroom, which is the preferred placement of all youngsters with disabilities and all youngsters without disabilities. But sometimes that is not gonna be appropriate to meet a child's needs or provide FAPE. In that case, self-contained settings must be used. And that's generally defined as being a child spending over 50% of their school day in a self-contained setting. Uh, there are in some instances, not many special schools and finally, the most restrictive option is hospital and institutional settings. That doesn't mean that all school districts have to have these options, but they have to have them available if that's what a child needs to receive a free appropriate public education. So uh, oftentimes the IEP team 
is the team that determines placement. So this is, and this is very important. Um, I've been in IEP teams where parents wanted to discuss the placement first. You can't really do that because the law says you have to develop the child's program before you determine placement. So in other words, you have to determine what before you determine where. So number one, we write the IEP, what is appropriate, what will enable a child to make progress in terms of present levels of, of academic achievement, functional performance state statements, measurable goals, a method to met, collect data on the progress of the child toward meeting those goals and sharing that information with the parents, the special ed services, the determination of fate, that's what has to be done first. And then after that is accomplished, the IEP team can determine, can turn to placement determination. And placement determination essentially is, can we, re in what setting or placement option can we receive, will a child receive FAPE? preferably in the general ed setting. And nationally speaking, about 90% of all special ed students spend the majority of the time in general ed classrooms, or do we need supplementary aids and services to be provided in order to child to receive a FAPE? If no, well, then we have the continuum of, of alternative placements that I just talked about. We go through those and determine what's the least restrictive environment in which a child can receive FAPE. So determining FAPE is really the paramount or the preeminent thing you do as in special ed, as parents and school district working together is determine what's appropriate for the child. Then we look at least restrict environment. But at any rate, if we put children in an integrated, uh, in a uh, setting that's, little up the continuum, we always have to provide for integrated experiences. So think about this, the right, this is the right way, Barbara Bateman talked about doing the assessment first. Once the assessment's done, and remember that's the foundation, then we move to programming. What are the goals? What are the methods of measurement? How will we collect data? How will we share this data with the student's parents? Once we have that part of the IEP written, we can talk about placement. In what placement will be the least restrictive environment in which a child can receive a FAPE? So courts have often said the first, the most important aspect of the idea is FAPE. The sec second of that is LRE. So that's the right way, assessment, programming, placement. The wrong way is assessment, placement, programming. That's a procedure that some attorneys refer to as shoehorning. It's not, it's placing the child first and then trying to shoehorn the program into the child's placement. That would be illegal, you can't do that. So now I'm gonna stop for a minute because, uh, and just to say, are there any questions that folks have? I know we've been going through things real quickly. Um, Yes, uh, if you have any particular instances that you folks would like to email me about, feel free to. I would just say I'm not an attorney. I can give you advice. I can't give you legal advice, but I'll be happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Um, if a ch this, There was a really good question by Melissa. If a student is only in self thing classes with no mainstreaming, does a general ed teacher have to attend the meeting? Um, yes, they do. Um, it might be difficult, but nonetheless, that's still a requirement of the idea. Generally, in the, if they're in a self-contained setting, we're always looking at eventually moving a child to a least restrictive setting. And so a general ed teacher should always be on the IEP team. Um, if a measuring tool is a teacher checklist, can parents reasonably expect that this be included in the child's school record? Generally, I don't like teacher checklists for uh, measurement. Now in some areas, uh, checklists, uh, 
subjective a judgment uh, assessment is important, like in communication. But in those areas, there should be a, a checklist. But generally, when you look at um, uh, reading behavior, there are easy ways to measure student student progress without uh, relying on subjective judgment. It's important to uh, rely on objective judgment whenever possible. Um, I'm going to go back since that seems to be all the questions. I'm going to go back here for a second and just share my screen again. Um, oops, don't want to do that. There we go. Uh, there are procedural safeguards and I won't talk about these, um, but the, our state department, it, you know, there are some instances in which parents and school district personnel cannot agree on an issue. And the law idea includes these dispute resolution options. Um, if you can agree, I'd say the the best, one of the best things we have in our state is we have an ombudsman uh, that we can go through. I would say there are, there are two major types of dispute resolution. There's adjudicative where you actually go to do process hearings. That's what I do now. Uh, and you can even go to court. That is a very expensive, time consuming and emotional endeavor. Uh, when at all possible, I would say go through your state department um, start out if there you cannot uh, achieve kind of a meeting of the minds with the ombudsman. Uh, we have uh, our state uh, has mediation, IEP facilitation, can work with the ombudsman for the state. These are really good options. Um, there are always due process hearings and there are always state complaints. But the best thing is to, when you are have disputes, is to try and work these out short of these procedures. Uh, and what I would say is um, if you just can't find an agreement, go to the special ed director, you know, go through and, and talk to school district personnel. That's where we always want to begin. If that cannot work, we have an ombudsman at the South Carolina Office of Special Ed Services. I believe it's still Lynette Cox. That's her number. That person is just there to act as an intermediary between parents and school personnel when there is a problem. We also always have the option of state complaints. Um, but I would say, if there is a dispute, your first option is to take it to the special ed director, uh, talk with them about it, um, talk to the ombudsman. Um, we have different options, like I said, IEP facilitation and mediation that we can uh, use. There is this option of dispute resolution through due process hearings. We would like to avoid those whenever possible. Um, they're, like I said, they're expensive. Um, they're time consuming, uh, emotionally a very difficult thing. So. In terms of disputes, it would be my advice to try and go through uh, through normal channels uh, and state ombudsman. Now, I would also tell you I'm gonna I emailed this to this handout or these slides to Suzanne. She will be able to uh, give them to you if you want. You could email me uh, with any questions you might have. I'll be glad to answer uh, and. Uh, send you the slides. So thank you very much.